Now, it's awesome. Going. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Blessed Sabbath. Good morning. Here in this part of the world, in uh, Tennessee area here, Benton, Tennessee area, Delano, actually, it's it's quite crisp and brisk. I think the high today will be about 23, and it was, by in Mineral Bluff, it was 11 degrees? Mm, that's what it was in Murphy. It was okay. 13 and 12. And so for those, for those in the northern parts of the world, you know, I, I know you're used to much colder. I'm from Wisconsin, so I know, but... For this part of the world, it doesn't get much colder than this. And so I'm grateful that there are uh, some who have chosen to brave the cold weather and come out. And on my way driving through, you know, the Okoe kind of river canyon, you've got all the, the bare rock cliffs. And a lot of times you have the water that the drips icicles. down. Yeah, you have these awesome icicles that are going on right now all through the canyon. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. So I'm really grateful. Um, so before we get into the study this morning, just want to share a few things. So, someone, some of you guys might know uh, a man named Timothy Faulkner. Who he's, he came down for Pastor Adrian's meetings in June. Oh, yes. And from the guy he, from Michigan? Yes, yeah. And then he came for Tabernacles and he came for the Bible training in October. Well, he was just recently, actually on Wednesday night, he was disfellowshipped from his church uh, in Michigan. Finally. And he had, uh, over the last couple of months, he had, it started with a letter that he made, a letter that was just basically a declaration of, of his convictions, of his faith, on the identity of God and his son, and on the subjects of the covenants, and also on the identity of the daily, uh, from Daniel chapter 8. And he issued this letter, and he sent it to you know, the pastor and to the elders, and I believe the board, and then they asked him to come, and he ended up sharing. He read that letter publicly, and then they made a decision that they were going to bring his membership up to vote in the next church business meeting, which happened to be this past week. And, uh, and Timothy didn't realize that, according to the church manual, you actually have the opportunity to speak. Uh, if the church or the leadership of the church are following the manual, they, they have to give you that opportunity to share your convictions and, and make your appeal. And so they did. They gave him five minutes. And Truth is not much time. No, it's not much time. And uh, some have gotten much less, like myself. And uh, in the first wave of us, there were two groups that were just fellowship from our church in Wisconsin. There were five in the first wave, myself included, and then another, I believe, seven in the second wave. And in the first wave... We each only had two minutes to speak. That's so, what they did for us. Really? Same, Same for you. At the church where I got this fellowship, too, they gave us two minutes to defend our position. Wow. Or or to, to make an appeal, whatever. Okay. And why did, uh, is that why did they the give themselves? No. Yeah, they, well, that, I'm limited amounts of time, I suppose. They voted to only give people two minutes and, to comment. And in, in a lot of cases, and, and Timothy is really praising God, I mean, it's clear that... That the, the atmosphere that, that was there, I think it was a direct result of <laughs> the Spirit of Christ in him through this whole process. He hasn't been accusatory or condemnatory toward the church and to the leadership. He has just stated his convictions and left it up to the church as to do with it as they see best according to the church manual, according to the Bible. And so he hasn't, he hasn't tried to be aggressive and as a result, they actually gave him, even, even though that's not much, they gave him that five minutes to speak. Whereas a lot of the experiences of others, especially in Michigan in that conference, they have usurped and bypassed the, the church manual altogether. And people even haven't had an opportunity to testify. They haven't had an opportunity to speak. They would just be removed from fellowship without that process. And so the whole process, even though he was this fellowship, it went about as good as you could expect. And in... In that final meeting on Wednesday night in the, the church business meeting, he, he made an appeal, and I actually, I want to read to you guys the last, the last paragraph of his appeal. It's, it's powerful, and it is inc it's incredibly solemn, and I know that uh, without a doubt, all the people that attended that business meeting, they, they, it would have been clear in their minds as to what they were about to do based on his appeal, so I'm going to pull this up for you. Now, I thought he was going to a home fellowship. He was, for, but oh, okay. yeah, he was. But his last, the last church that he was <laughs> a part of, that's, oh, that's the okay. one that what, he what name made a statement. Timothy, Timothy Faulkner up in Michigan. Yeah. 
So, okay. Let's get to that. Here we go. Here's, here's the last paragraph of his speech that he gave in the business meeting on Wednesday. Brothers and sisters, if you choose to vote me out of fellowship this evening, you're not just voting me out. You'll be voting out the pioneers and Sister White as well. Because I represent the faith that by God's grace they founded. You will be taking a stand on who your God is. Mm. Wow. As a watchman on the wall, I humbly appeal to you tonight that wow. if you haven't studied this out wholeheartedly and with an open mind, that you may want to reconsider your participation in this vote. Mm. Powerful appeal. The Jews didn't consider before they proclaimed, let his blood be on us and our children. And they crucified Jesus. Having not studied this for yourself, are you certain that you're not crucifying the Son of God afresh? Wow. Yeah. Do you imagine being in that audience and hearing that? He goes on, regardless of the outcome, I will always love and care about each and every one of you. I'm in my Father's hands, and He'll lead me where I'm to go. So the question tonight is, are the SDA pioneers going to be disfellowship from this church tonight or not? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Wow. Thank you. But, but, the, have, but the pioneers have already been disfellowshipped. Oh yes, yeah. that's true. Mm -hmm. But each each church has an opportunity. Will they follow what has already been done by the right. overall church leadership and the conference leadership, or will they respond to the Spirit of God? Will they respond to reason? Will they respond and say, you know what? I mean, that, it, it can't get any clearer. The implications are crystal clear for those who were in attendance that night as to what they were about to do. Right. And that appeal, it was, it, like you said, it was direct, but it would have been given, because I, I know Timothy, and, and in talking with him, it would have been given, you know, with, with the most, like, his Jesus, when he, would, when he would issue these rebukes to the Pharisees, he would do it with tears in his eyes. His heart is broken. And so Timothy makes this appeal, and it would have been clear, like, how could it, they all would have been convicted, and how could you in good conscience make a vote on something that you may not have even studied? And so they asked him, after he made that appeal, they asked him to leave the room, and they deliberated for a half hour wow. before he came back. Wow. Half hour. He was out for a half hour, and then they called him back in, and they told him that we've decided to disfellowship you. So how long did, were we deliberating over us? Like, uh, they didn't deliberate. They allowed everybody that wanted to make a statement up to two minutes to make a statement, and then they took a um, paper vote. No, 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 no. I'm talking about Murphy. It was about oh. an hour, wasn't it? Oh, you're talking about like when they minutes. were voting whether we were allowed to attend church again. I think it was maybe 15 minutes that they discussed yeah, it. Wasn't, it wasn't a half an hour. When, when we were just fellowship, it was the same. We, we, they didn't ask us to leave the room. They just took a paper vote. What was interesting with our experience as well is that they didn't inform the church body as to why they were coming to the meeting. They just said, you have to come to this meeting. Oh my. So they, got, they were blind, blindsided. Oh my. And oh, wow. they they were protesting. There were many members who had no idea that this was the issue and that we were about to be voted to be this fellowship. They were protesting. Can you reconsider? And the pastor said, no, we've gone through meetings with the elders. We need to make this vote tonight. Wow. And because he initially had tried earlier in that same meeting that night and they people were protesting. So then he had to step back and they needed to get firm with them. And then he, he started handing out the ballots again. So it was a paper vote. For us too and what was interesting is that we were voted out i think it was like 15 in favor of us being this fellowship and 13 against it they wouldn't even give us the vote count okay <laughs> at least you got to hear the vote count, we got so it as close yeah we got it afterwards and and then seven people abstained mm -hmm. because they just as timothy's yeah, appeal was yeah, yeah they, they hadn't studied it for themselves and so i know that everybody would have been convicted that night so just you know we, we need to pray for them in that group mm -hmm. as well so, yeah, so I just, I'm in. Did you say this was the church you went to? No, this was uh, the one in Michigan, but what I went to were just kind of recounting the similar experience. What was the name of that church that they just... Oh, I, I don't remember the name of it. Yeah, yeah, and I don't, I don't know that Timothy would want us to disclose the name at this time. So, yeah, so that, um, 
it was praise God that, that Timothy was able to you know, respond to the Spirit of God, you know, share his conviction in love, but directly, mm-hmm. and that God can work in this. Laura said, his seeds are planted, and we pray for these people. You know, because we know that, that, that he said the looks on their faces, the eyes that were getting wide and the responses, I mean, clearly the truth hit home. The Spirit of God was working. And so we pray that in these coming days and weeks ahead that we know that they'll be nagged in their conscience with these things, and God's going to be trying to reach them. And so I pray that they would respond and receive repentance, ultimately. Right? Because all of us need, all of us have worshipped a false god. All of us have participated in this sin. Forgive us for the sins that we have committed, and we all, if we haven't, we all need the repentance from God. Um, because it, it's caused grief to Him, and sorrow, and, and it's caused, obviously, grief to the cause, to the advance of the true gospel. So, yeah. And before I get into the lesson study, that's what we're going to do today. Uh, I also just want to share that you guys have probably, if you've even caught headlines or in talking to friends or family, you know, we continue to hear rumors of wars and agitation. Now it seems like there's less attention on Israel and what's going on in the Middle East, although I think recently we're still, the United States government still bombing in Yemen, I believe. But now the shift is back to Europe. And there's been talk of escalation and that NATO is about to do its largest military operation since the Cold War. Uh, so they're, they're on high alert. And apparently there were plans leaked that Russia was planning an invasion either this year or next year. I can't remember. So uh, there's just, invasion again... Invasion into where? Invasion into... A NATO country? Yeah. Poland. I maybe heard. Poland. Yeah. I, I don't remember. So whether that's true or not, whether it's just propaganda, I think it's, it's hard propaganda. to know. I yeah. suspect it's propaganda. Russia would not be foolish enough to make an open attack on a NATO country. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I mean, they're, they're, if anything, I mean, we know there's, that they do false flags. So they may, may make it appear that Russia, you know, they're, they're putting out this propaganda and they make it appear mm-hmm. just like Germany did. Yeah. Germany did the same thing on the Reichstag. You know, they, they tried to make it look like their opposition and attack. And they had done it themselves. Yeah, so I mean... If, if you just look at, if you, if you try to empathize with, you know, Russia, who is being painted as, you know, the, the or originator of all evil, if you try to empathize with them, when you have, you know, the United States that has, I think, a military budget that's larger than the next nine nations combined, when you look at how many military bases, hundreds of military bases we have all over the world compared to Russia and China, which have almost nothing, and those are the next largest militaries, and then you see what our CIA has done over the years, the amount of democracies that it has toppled, including what we did to the State Department in Ukraine in 2014. Yes, took out the pro-Russian government Absolutely. and put in a pro-NATO government. And then since the fall of the Berlin Wall and you know the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, watching how many countries have come on board with NATO, like what do you do if you're in Russia's position? Out of desperation, they tried to do something to try to bring about like, a, a truce, like stop advancing, stop encroaching right. on our territory, stop bringing your missile systems and potential missiles with nukes closer to our capital. You can't blame them at all. Right. So, yeah, so again, we, we know, I think in our group, we know not to believe these things that we're hearing in the media and to not put our trust in princes and in leaders and in any man to save us. Uh, and so more than ever now with everything that's going on, and then of course, talk of this uh, this next pandemic and this what do they call it like the the X, vi- X. Mutant, you know, yeah virus X or and whatever. so that this could be fifty times deadlier and all these things so it's constantly using fear and of climate change agendas and on and on to again cause us to be in a place where we will just relinquish our liberties and allow basically the leaders of the world to direct us in every aspect of our lives and so. Yeah, this is why we come at the Sabbath, guys. This is why we come to God's appointed times, is to receive that blessing, to receive that peace, sanctification, protection. And so we're going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our lesson study. So please join me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for bringing us here and for the warmth of your love amidst the cold that a lot of this country is experiencing at the present time. And uh, Father, we're grateful that 
we have uh, warmth here, uh, we have a fire, we are taken care of. There are many far across this world and even in this country homeless in places that are very cold that don't have these things. And th this is, it's not going to end, Father, the amount of suffering in this world until uh, the gospel is advanced to all the ends of the earth, until your people are, are with faces lighted up, proclaiming your name, your character, uh, to where, Father, by beholding you, that we are set free completely from sin, and then, Father, the gospel can go forth to all nations, kindred, peoples, and tongues, and your Son can return. And so I just pray that you would help us. This is why we've come, Father, to learn from you through your word. Please give us of your spirit and guide us and lead us into all truth. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So after this session, then we'll take a break and we'll set up for communion. And so we'll, we'll begin that with testimonies. We'll have, we'll have some hymns. We'll begin that with some testimonies and prayer requests. And then Dennis will have a few words and then we'll go into foot washing and communion. So right now, uh, we're going to get into this study here. This is, uh, for those who might see this recording, this is one of our Sabbath School publications that we have put out uh, our... <coughs> Uh, dear brothers in the Latin American world, the Spanish-speaking world, have put this together in Spanish first, and we translated it. They translated it in English, and we helped to edit it all. So this is what we will be doing over the next few months, and this is on the Bible itself. So every aspect of what does the Bible say as to who Jesus is and as to who God is, how do we know that the Bible is true and valid, why is it that over several thousand years, millions upon millions of people have been willing to give up their lives, but to not give up the truths that are contained in this book? What about this book is so important? And what does it, again, how do we know that it is valid and indeed true? We look, look at prophecy. But in the beginning for this first study, we're going to look at... Jesus as the Word of God and what the written Word says about Him. And it's going to be a beautiful study. It's, you'll, a lot of these verses we'll be familiar with, but quickly how this study was put together, you'll, we're going to get to some really, really important questions about why, why is it that Jesus came and what did He reveal when He did come. And so that's how we'll end this study. So if you don't have one, that's okay. You can just follow along and listen. We're going to be obviously opening up our Bible, looking at the verses. I accidentally left mine at home. I was not nope. in the right spot. No problem. Went out the door, down the road, I went, oh no. Did you start this Here's why I read earlier? Mine. No, we're on the first one. We're going to start with Yeah, this is our very first one. Yeah, yeah, right. this is our very first one here. So let's look at the first question. And I, mean, I just want to point this out as well. Um, there are a couple more things. So this is. The first one, I think we, we have about five different Sabbath schools, if I remember correctly. We have two on the identity of God and His Son. One that focuses more on directly the Father and Son from Scriptures. And the other one is applying that pattern into human relationships. So the divine pattern. We have another one on identity. What makes us valuable? Where, does our wor where do we find our worth? We have another one on the first set, seven chapters of Revelation, and I think, two, three, yes, I think we have about five of them now. Wow. And so, yeah, we want to cover the entire Bible, all of the gospel through these Sabbath schools. And these are good for Bible studies. It's not like we just you just have to have a Sabbath school program with a home church gathering. You can use lessons from here to give Bible studies to people. And we're doing, I'm using this, what I'm going to be sharing today I've done, I think we've done two short videos uh, on our YouTube channel. And so you can find those if you want to share that with any friends or family. And it's all, that's all Bible only, the video shorts that we've been doing. And so, yes, yeah, so that's, that's what we have. You can find all of these on Maranatha Media in their study section. You can also contact us and we do print these as well. So if you want physical copies, just reach out to us. All right, so question number one. Who was in the beginning, who was he with, and who was he? Jesus. Yes. 
So let's look at the Bible. What does the Bible have to say? Because, again, let the Bible explain itself. It's its own expositor and interpreter. So let's look at John chapter 1. So who was he in the beginning? Who was he with? And who was he? John chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 and 14 and 18. These are important questions because uh, Very. even in our own little group, I think there's uh, some misunderstanding about what to, where to read in John chapter 1 here. Mm. And more specifically, is Jesus, the, is Jesus God? Yes. Uh, the, I've talked to some people and they seem to misunderstand that he is God. Mm. So this is an important lesson to study right now. Absolutely. So let's look at it. Let's look at John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 to begin. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. So it's, it's showing there's two, there's, there's two individuals we're talking about here. The Word and God. And the Word was God. So you're like, wait, what, what does that mean? Because it says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. But yet the Word was God. You can see how you get confused if you don't look at context and if you don't look at more passages in the Bible. So you're absolutely right, Dennis. And let's look at verse 2. The same was in the beginning with God. So let's answer the first part of our questions. So who was in the beginning? The Word. The Word, okay. And who was the Word with? Uh, he was with God, absolutely. Now, to answer who was he, let's look at... Before you go yes, on. Yes, when, when we read these first three words, in the beginning, what should that immediately remind us of? Should remind us of before creation that's in my mind yes well genesis 1 1 mm. how the bible begins with the genesis begins with these three words in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth <coughs> so whatever else we, we can know about the word he pre-existed the beginning and and what is that beginning so in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth the earth was without form and void so as i understand it the universe was created way before 6,000 years ago when this earth was terraformed and, and to support life. So Christ pre-existed the creation of the universe. And in fact, the Bible says he made, that he made all things. Without him, nothing was made that was made. So I, I've, you know, anybody that believes that Christ did not become into existence until the incarnation, this, this, shows that was the lie. And the other point I wanted to make about this, and it's sadly, it was, it's missed in, in almost all translations to not have this first uh, sentence correct. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. In the Greek, in uh, ein ha lagos, lagos being the Word, arche beginning, and kai lagos, he, she, or it was, with tan theon. Tan is a definite article. Tan theon. So the God. He was with the God. Yeah. And when you have a definite article, it's saying there's only one. Yeah. And so when we, when we continue, the word was with the God, the one true God of Scripture, the only true God, as Jesus referred to in John 17, 3. Amen. And the word was God. So when we read this, We've got to understand, even though it's still, the word was theon, theos, theos, we've got to understand how, how, the only way that we can reconcile this to have it make sense is there's got to be two different, two different definitions of God. Mm, God as the God, the one true God, the source, the origin of all life. And God, and when Jesus is called God, it's clearly referring to his divine nature. Mm -hmm. That he has the same nature that his father has. Because clearly there can't be two the gods. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. So you can, through, through two different ways, we can rightly understand what it means for Jesus to be, in the English, to be God. Not God is in the one true God, which... If we just look at the English language or any whatever your native language is, and you look at your Bible and you compare Scripture with Scripture, 
that is very clear, as Wayne has said in John 17, 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, many other passages where Jesus refers to his Father as his God. And he separates his identity from the true God. So we have that, and then what Wayne pointed out in the Greek, the Greek shows that distinction as well. So here we're dealing clearly then with divinity. We're about to get into that. Why is it that Jesus is divine like his Father? We'll get into that as the study goes. Dennis. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves because I know we, we kind of address this point later on, but... <clears throat> I think if we read it in a different way as the Bible um, describes it. Now, if we go over to verse 14. Yep, and that's exactly where we're going, so thank you. Why don't you read 14 for us? And it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So if the Word is the only begotten of the Father, let's put that in there. In the beginning was the only begotten of the Father, and the only begotten of the Father was with God, and the only begotten of the Father was God. Mm. The same, the only begotten of the Father, was in the beginning with God. Mm. So if we substitute those words in there because they're the same, the Word is the only begotten of the Father, I think it might make it a little bit more clear. Yes, thank you. And that identifies, let me ask that the last question in the series there with number one. So who was the Word? And, and how do we know from verse 14 who the Word was? So I'm looking for the answer from verse, verse 14. You guys help me out with that. Identifying who was the Word in verse 14 tells us. The only begotten. Yep, and the one that became flesh. Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh man. And to help us understand why it is that the Word was God, according to John 1 1, you can use the illustration of Adam and Eve, male and female, creating them made in his image. And, and look at the parallel. See if you can see a parallel here. I'm going to read to you guys Genesis 5 verse 2 okay and think of that in context of the word was with god and the word was god here here's what it says male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name adam in the day when they were created called their name adam so let me ask you the question eve came from where adam. she came from adam is she any less human than Adam? No. no. She is a human. Why? Because she came from the side of a human, Adam. Christ is God. Why? Because he came from the bosom. In other words, if you can use equate humanity, Eve being human, just as Adam is, as Jesus being divine, as Wayne had pointed out in Dennis, just as his father is. Do mm -hmm. we see that? How that parallel helps? Yes, Shannon. A little bit off the subject, but why is Yeshua the Word? Does that represent truth? Yes, he is and truth. And if, if if the one true God is invisible, that no man has seen at any time, except for the begotten, then Jesus is visible, right? We know right, that right. when He came, when He was incarnated, we could see Him. Okay, and so He also is. And it, and it, it's in essence, and we're about to get to this pattern, my thoughts are visible to you. You can't see my thoughts, but when I speak, that gives you a clue as right. to what well, my thoughts are. Okay. Jesus, is. that's why I believe he is the word of God. You know, he is that visible manifestation as oh, to who his okay. father okay. is. He is, as it says in, I don't forget where this is in the writings of Ellen White, but yeah. he's God's thought made audible. 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 Okay, yeah. okay. That makes sense. Cool, good question. Yeah. All right, so let's look at one more verse there, uh, verse 18. It says, No man has seen God at any time. Exactly what we were talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. So it's only, and this, and this also is, is a clue into answering the question, why is it that an angel couldn't have come and, again, revealed God and then 
paid the price, you know, they experienced the consequences of sin, the wages of sin being death. Why is it that an angel couldn't do that? This is giving us a clue. We're going to elaborate on that as well. Because they're created. They were created, but we need we need a, a better answer. Come from the bosom of the Father. Exactly, exactly. And what is that about coming from the bosom of the Father? And we'll answer that in more depth. Yeah, the exact image. Yes, and, and what does that mean in the implications? We'll get into that. So let's go to question two now. And this is going to help us as well to answer, again, that relationship between the only begotten, the Word of God who dwelt in his Father's bosom, and why it indeed is that he was called God or divine. And so this answers Hebrews 1, chapter, or Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 through 6. Hebrews 1, 4 through 6. And if somebody could read that passage for us, that would be great. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. I'm just going to pause you there for a second, Jan. There's another answer, Shannon, to your question. It has in these last days, so God the Father... The God in these last days is spoken unto us how? By his Son. So therefore, mm -hmm. the Word. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can continue on. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Mm. Okay, could you read five and six for us? Oh. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. Mm. So this is connecting John chapter 1, where the Word, he was made flesh, and that he is the only begotten Son. He dwelt in the bosom of the Father. So let's answer this question. And what is the relationship between the Word, who was made flesh, and God? What is this told? What, what did we just learn here in Hebrews? He's the son. He is the Son of God. Absolutely. That he's the son of God. And why? Why is he the son of God? Because he came from the bosom of the Father. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. just, just like, why why is Obadiah Wayne and Laura's son? Because he came from them. You know? It's, it's beautiful. It's simple. We, God's we not any have different. We at least, um, Satan's um, deception. It's a tendency to negate, negate um, this idea that the Father can be a true Father in divinity. The Divine Father can be a, a true Father and the Divine Son can be a true Son. Mm -hmm. Because they want to claim that you cannot uh, equate humanity with divinity. But the example has already been given us that we are created in the likeness and in the image of divinity. Amen. Right? So therefore, that connection is straight. Absolutely. And there is a definite connection. So, just like uh, you and I have an earthly father, which makes us human, Christ has a heavenly father, a divine father, which makes him divine. Amen. Simple as that. Absolutely. And he is divine because what did Hebrews tell us? Obviously, he's the son of God. He was begotten. And so he received a better name or character, which also is another clue as to why it was him who needed to be the one to come to reveal his father. But why has he received all these things? Why is he divine? He's his son. And so if he's his son, he's what? What does Hebrews tell us? Looking for the word in verse 4. It all, it, it's implied, and everything we've said is implied, but what in verse 4 is telling us? He received a better name how? By inheritance. By inheritance. He inherited it because he came from his father. He inherited his divinity, in other words. And that's father. what we do. We inherit yes. the name Amen. 
of our father. Absolutely. Wayne, and then you had your hand up as well, Jenny? Yeah. I just wanted to say, oh, well, you said go. Wayne. It's okay. Well, just that, you know, one of the <laughs> things that gets brought up is that, well, then who was the mother? Of course. God is... I, that's carnal mother. thinking. Say this, say this too. Say, say when they say, "Well, who is the mother?" Say, "Who was Eve's mother?" Right. There you go. It, it, it doesn't answer. say he was born of God. Either. This is begotten. Yeah, brought yeah, forth. Brought forth. Came different. out from. Yeah, that's a different. Yeah. Um, I was just curious. You know, when we I, I talked about how there was a definite article in John one one. And I was just curious, in Hebrews 1, mm. there's also a definite article. Oh, it's ha okay. theos. Wow. Ha, the, the letter O with an apostrophe okay. over it is, is the definite article. Okay. So the God, who at various Very times good. and ways spoke to us in times past. Wow. Us, awesome. Us, spoke of That's us. great. That's cool. What, um, what, so you've got an app and then it's just giving you the Greek? Uh, uh, it's the Hebrew, uh, it's the uh, Greek and Hebrew lexicon. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you the, the app. It's a free app you can put on your cool. phone. Thanks, man. Yeah, good point. All right. So let's move on to question number three. Concerning all things, what is said of them? So what's said of all things in relation to the Father, in relation to Jesus Christ? And this is beautiful, and it's, it's simple, but we complicate it and we forget it. And then we do what Dennis had said. People say, you can't equate the human with the divine. Uh, but there's a pattern here. And so let's look at this relationship. And let's go to 1 Corinthians 8, 6. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things. And we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Okay, so there is the of, the of whom are all things, and source. then, yeah, or the source, and I believe the Greek word for that is ek, okay? And then there is the by whom are all things, or the... Channel. Channel, and I believe that's dia in the Greek. Yes. Okay, so all to answer that question, then what are what is the relationship between all of creation and the one true God who the Bible identifies right here in this verse? So that's helping you to go back to John to answer the question as to who is God. It's saying right here, it's the Father. Okay, and then. His Son, His only begotten Son, the Word of God who was made flesh, who inherited everything from His Father because He came from Him. What is the relationship to all creation to God and His Son? What does this tell us? Source and channel. So mm -hmm. just, it's, mm -hmm. it's simple, but what, is that, what does that mean? So all things are related to, let's go with God first. How are all things related to God the Father? He is the Alpha. He is the Alpha. All the things, source. the source, thank mm -hmm. you. Now, how do all things in creation relate to his son, to Jesus? He put it together. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So God, through his son, the channel, created mm -hmm. all things. Mm -hmm. And just and this confirms, there's a lot of verses that support this, but mm -hmm. where, where does every good and perfect gift come from? Father. Mm -hmm. The Father of lights comes from above. So again, confirming he is the source of all mm -hmm. of these things. All right. Now I want to look at a couple, I want to give you a couple of examples of this source channel relationship. And then there's, there are notes at the end of this chapter. And I realize that we don't have uh, the corresponding references, you know, like which, in which question do we use which notes. So I, in my studies, I did my best to uh, apply the notes to certain questions where I thought they were most relevant. So we will have our first note that I want to read as well. But before that, I want to ask, what, what do you, since all things, all things in creation, everything that we can see and what we can't see, it's all made after this pattern of source and channel, okay? So give me just a couple of examples as to this pattern. Uh, where do we, how do we see this? How do we see it in, in human relationships? How do we see it in creation? How do we see it in different aspects of the Bible even? Um, okay, in human relationships, 
uh, there's a thing called family. Yes. All right? In which the head, the source, is the husband, but it doesn't stop there because the true head and source is the father. Mm. Through Christ, through the husband, mm -hmm. through the wife, mm -hmm. and to the children. But he wants to go out too. He can go out. Mm -hmm. He absolutely does. <laughs> Amen. So that's one example. Mm. But another example is the way that the world has set up its governmental structure. Mm. No, no matter what type of government there is in the country, there is a head mm. and there is a subordinate. Mm. So there is a, there is a pattern as, in that as well. No, man. You can see that in the workplace, right? In yep. corporations. Uh, this idea of source and channel goes through all of our culture and society. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Any other examples that come to mind of this pattern of two, source and channel, father and son? Dennis has said some human relationship examples, husband and wife, parents and children, and then within governmental structures, within companies, <coughs> headship, <coughs> place it. Produce fruit, fruit produce seeds. Yeah, yes, so let's talk, about, let's talk about that with trees, because that's one of the examples I've written down. So in order to get that fruit and that the part above ground, the visible part, what do you need? God. You need God, but what? In order to get the Sunlight above ground, water. yes, yes, yes. What's what can you not see? The roots. The roots. Right. Um, the root anchors the tree. Yes. The root accesses a lot of nutrients that it can't get from just above ground as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. So you have a source and channel. There's another aspect to this relationship is is invisible, visible. Mm -hmm. Christ is the express image of the invisible God. He is. The brightness of his father's glory. So there's another aspect there. So you see it with trees, which is pretty cool. You see it with a lot of things uh, out in nature. Um, what is, what, here's another example of that source channel and invisible visible. So let's think of rivers. What is, what is the source of a river? The river is visible. What's, what's its source? The race on this pattern. Rain. Yeah, but there's more. There's more. Yes, rain. But he knows. Ocean. Ocean. Yeah, ocean transpiration, yeah. evaporation. There yeah. comes the rain. Water, water cycle. Yeah, water cycle. But there's still there's a part of the water cycle. There's a part of that whole thing. Springs, underground there, springs. There. There. That's and that's. Can you see it? No, no it's invisible. Yeah. So the mighty like, Mississippi. The underground the spring. springs. The, 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 the yeah. Oh. Where like if you if you can actually look at the source of the Mississippi River in Minnesota, it's. It's small. You would look at that and you think, how in the world could this produce a gigantic river? Ah. But, I mean, it's, it's the beginning point of it. There's a lot of water in, invisibly underground that we can't see. True. And so it starts there and it becomes visible. Right. So you can see again, Christ, the Word of God, the visible manifestation expression of who God is to us. Right. And so there's another example of nature. Very what good. about... Were you going to say something, Jen? No, I just okay. said very good. Yeah, what about <laughs> now related to... The Bible itself, and you also have, back to Christ being the living Word of God, you have the written Word, right? right? So you have a pattern right there, a source channel relationship. Old and New Testament. Old and New Testament. What's the source, Wayne? Old Testament. Old Testament. The Torah, right? And then the channel being the New Testament. And what about the law of God? Is there is there a pattern there as well? Okay, if, if you guys... If you guys have the pattern in your mind, then tell me what would what's the pattern? That pattern of source and channel within the law of God. There's a couple of them. So the law of God isn't just the Ten Commandments, but you could focus on the Ten Commandments. You have the source being right, the the first the old covenant. Well, the, that's that's different. Old that's different. Covenant. Yeah, but you can you definitely have a, a relationship there too, a pattern of old and new covenants. But you have the first commandments, right? Those. Our, our relationship. The relationship between God, us and God. And us and God. Between us and a fellow man. Yeah. So there's one example of source and channel. And what about, if you look at all of the law of God, which includes the law of Moses. So you have the Ten Commandments. Oh, yeah, right? the statutes for, yeah. And, the, and the Ten Commandments. Absolutely. That, it, the, the statutes and the judgments of the law of Moses are a magnification of what is contained in the law of God. It's just spelling those out into in, in, in more detail, more applications. And so and you have that relationship. Think about the Sermon on the Mount and how Jesus puts mm. that to the spiritual level. Absolutely. Not just, um, activity. 
about what's going on in the world. Yeah, so there's another, there's another exa example of that as well. Um, so I think, yeah, I think we've covered a good, a good number of examples there. So now, if you guys have the, your copy with you, turn to the first note here. We're going to read from Desire of Ages. This is really beautiful. And this is in relation to the question we're asking concerning all things, what is said of them in relation to the Father, in relation to Jesus Christ? And it says this, But turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to give. So again, he's, she's saying, look unto Jesus. This is teaching us about God. And it is his glory, or it is in his nature, his character, his DNA, to give. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living, and Dennis, this is again back to this, the beautiful relationship and the trust and the dependence that Christ, <laughs> as the Son of God, not God the Son, but as the Son of God, who has come from His Father, has received all things, as it says in Hebrews, mm -hmm. right? He's received, through inheritance, a better name. This is supporting these verses in John that we're about to look at. I do nothing of myself, said Christ. The living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father. I seek not mine own glory, but the glory of him that sent me. And John 8, 28 and 6, 57, 8, 50, 7, 18. So this is showing us that he doesn't do anything of himself. He's received everything from his Father. So that, that, would, include, that would include all the miracles that he did. He couldn't just do that by manifesting his own power. He received these from his Father as he asked which is profound, because again, he is our great example and pattern in all things. He didn't trust in himself, in his power, he trusted solely in his Father, who is his God. And that's where Satan tried to tempt him in the wilderness. He was dependent. Absolutely, completely dependent upon him. And that, that is the foundation for a completely different gospel than what all the rest of Christianity is teaching. Do we, do we see that? <coughs> Because all the rest of Christianity believes in God the Son, who is one of these co-equal, co-eternal members of this triune God, three that are one, who could never receive anything from God. Because somehow then that would denigrate or demean his, his position. He wouldn't then be God because he received something. But that's not what the Bible is teaching at all, which what, is liberating. What does 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says? For us, for unto us there is but one God, yep. the Father. Amen. Amen. Very plain. Yep. Let the Bible explain itself. So let's continue on here. In these words is set forth the great principle, which is the law of life for the universe. All things Christ received from God, but he took to give. So in the heavenly courts, in his ministry for all created beings, through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all. So there you go, the source, the great source. Through the Son, it returns, channel, in praise and joy service, a tide of love to the great source of all. And thus, through Christ, the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, the law of life. So this is establishing this relationship that we've identified in John and Hebrews and 1 Corinthians. And it's also teaching us about who God is because it says that we see that it is the glory of God to give. So it's showing us his character. Yeah, Dennis. Yes, in this, uh, in this depiction here, Desire of Ages, page 21, this is for who? This is for the whole universe. And what is given to the whole universe from the Father is life. Mm. Right? Because he says at the end here, the law of life. Mm. Oh. So, so we see the picture here of our Heavenly Father giving life to the whole universe through who? His Son. Right? We are part of that universe. Amen. So the Father gives life to us through his son. Mm. We see that and we understand that. But um, <clears throat> this depiction here 
clearly shows us the that divine pattern that is happening not only to us here on earth but in the universe so what is life what did Jesus say his father was a spirit and the spirit is what life so in actuality we see the father giving his spirit the his spirit life. of life to the whole universe mm -hmm. right? it began first by giving that to his son bringing forth his son so when the father wants to do that for <coughs> us sinners here on earth he gives what his spirit of life quote unquote the comforter right to Jesus and Jesus gives that comforter to us mm. it's just a branch of what is going on throughout the universe when Jesus when the Father gives us his spirit or his life mm -hmm. unto us Amen. to live in our hearts Jesus is our comforter because right. he has received comfort from the gospel comfort from his father right it's not he doesn't possess this in of himself uniquely again God is the great source of all all of these things come so it is through the circuit of beneficence this beautiful pattern that we're learning about okay let's turn the page now let's look at question number four and we're not going to get through all the questions because we'll probably we'll take maybe another five ten minutes and we'll wrap it up here so we'll answer a few more and then next time we can continue on where we left off because the last few questions are Paramount. They're vital. I mean, all of this is essential to understanding the gospel in the Bible. And it's essential to our experience, our salvation, knowing who our Father is and knowing how Jesus, again, how he lived on this earth. And ultimately, that teaches us about how it's been since eternity. And that's how we'll be in heaven. So these things are essential for us. And so let's look at question four. By whom? Were all things made? We've already answered it, but we'll look at some Bible verses. For whom were they created? So we looked at Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. Let's go to Colossians 1, 16. So by whom were all things made? And whom were they created for? Colossians 1, 16. And let's have... If someone would like to read that for us when you get there. Colossians 1, 16. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So how do we know who him is? Look at verse 15. What does that tell us? Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, oh, is the firstborn of every creature. And there's that pattern again. That in the source, the one true God is Father, invisible. No man has seen him at any time. And Jesus is the visible image of his Father. And so all things were created by him. And who were they created for? That's right. For him. Okay, question number five. Is there anything created that was not made by him? Well, we've already read in 1 Corinthians all things, right? Mm -hmm. But let's look at another verse. Again, the beautiful thing is, is we want to establish truths based upon multiple verses, multiple witnesses. And so for John 1 verse 3, let's go there and look at that. And would someone read that for us when you get there? All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Okay. Isn't that nice when the Bible can answer the questions for us? Mm -hmm. So who came into this world? We've already answered that, didn't we? When we read, we read John 1 earlier. Mm -hmm. So that was the Word or the Son of God. We receive all things through inheritance. Okay, let's go. And before before we continue, I want to read. There's a with question four: By whom were all things made? I want to look at note number two, and I want to look at a little bit of this. We're not we're not going to read all of it because it's it's a bit extensive. But this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, 
And there's some really profound points that, that I want to highlight here. So this is in relation to by whom are all things made and for whom were they created. So if you have your lesson, turn to number two, uh, note two. It says the following. The sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate. So this is about to tell us, okay, and this is, again, this is merely supporting what we've read in the Bible. In the beginning, as Wayne brought to us, who was there in the beginning before this earth was created? Who was there in eternity? And it says the following. And a co-worker who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. That's cool. And giving happiness to us. He wants to share the joy that he receives, that Jesus receives with his Father. He wants to give that joy unto us. I think that's beautiful. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So this is merely just confirming that they were in, in create, the active agents in creation were how many? Two, Two. right? That's what first, and John chapter 1, it tells us that. And in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and it says, The same was in the beginning with God. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Just adding more detail to what we've already seen in the Bible. The He's only, the only being. being. The presence of third spirit. No one else. No, because the Spirit, again, the Spirit is associated with God who gave it to His Son. Just as the Spirit, if you were to say the Spirit of Satan, it's not a separate being. If you were to say, you know, the, the Spirit of that, you know, that fellowship or that gathering, it's associated with, you know, the, the noun. Like, it's not, it's not separate at all. It's a descriptor. Okay, so Ben, yeah, I, I was just thinking about this. When when we get into discussions with with Adventists or or even people that aren't Adventists that believe in a trinity of three co-equal, co-eternal gods, persons, beings. I, I mean, especially well with Adventists, I'm specifically thinking of because they'll pull out these three quotes. You know, there are three, the three highest powers in heaven, or the three, and, and when you share this, this statement with them, the only being in the universe, you know, Christ was the only being in the universe with whom the Father could, could share his counsels or whatever, or, or she says the only, the only, there's only two beings in the universe worthy of worship, the Father and the Son, I'll paraphrase it. And, and you'll give these quotes, which... They'll, they'll, they won't explain them. They'll just ignore them and say, but what about? Yeah. And, and, and to, I'm, I'm just thinking how Jesus responded when they, would, they, when they would try to say, well, by what authority do you do these things? He said, I'll tell you what, I'll answer your question if you answer my question. The baptism of John, was it from God or from man? So say, look, I'll, I'll, I'll explain the three statement, when you explain how you can reconcile that with your belief in three beings. Mm. Yeah. And if they can't, once there's no point yeah. in continuing on. It's a yeah. fruitless endeavor. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point, Wayne. We should learn from the life of Jesus. How did he deal with these questions? And you're trying to find out, are they sincere or not? Are they open or not? And yes, if, if they just ignore these things, and try to say, what about this, this, this? And then we have, to, we have to change approaches. And so, yeah, that's very profound how Jesus dealt with them. Answer a question with a question. Okay, so I want to continue on here. His name should be called, so this is midway in that first paragraph. His name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Why is he called God again? Because by inheritance he received a better name, divinity. Okay, and it says... Uh, and the Son of God declares concerning himself. Notice that qualifier there. The Son of God declares concerning himself. So that, look at that clause. And what's he declaring? She's about to quote a passage in the Bible. I was set up from everlasting when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him as one brought up with him or taught of him. If you look at other translations, if you look at the Hebrew, 
And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. So the author here is saying that that passage in Proverbs, that personification of wisdom, that's speaking of the Son of God, that's speaking of Jesus and his origin in eternity being brought forth from his Father. Yeah, that quote there that, that uh, she writes, <clears throat> and the Son of God declares concerning himself, and then she goes on to read Proverbs 8, 22 to 30. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. <clears throat> I saw that in one of our Sabbath school lessons in January of 2012. And they quoted this very statement. But the unique thing about it was in the Sabbath school lesson, they left out concerning himself. Mm -hmm. So their quote in the Sabbath school lesson was, and the Son of God declares, oh my. the Lord possessed me in the beginning of huh. his way. Interesting. Wow. They left out concerning himself. You think that was a mistake? It was intentional. Clearly. Yeah. That's, that's so sad. And we can look at the Bible and say, okay, how, how do we know that wisdom is indeed the Son of God? What would you guys say? What verse in the New Testament are verses? Christ is unto us wisdom. Exactly. In Corinthians, I believe it's the first Corinthians. Uh, yeah, also Colossians. <laughs> yep. in, in him is uh, the wisdom. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the Bible itself, again, is telling us that indeed wisdom, as we see in Proverbs chapter 8, is it's the Son of God. So, yeah, that, that, that clause, that introductory clause that is so important. Uh, you cannot leave that out. That the Son of God declares concerning Himself. Where did they change that? Or leave it out? In the Sabbath school lesson, January 2012. Um, and then you can see here, this is confirming. I'm not going to read all the second paragraph, uh, but you can see the beginning of it. It's confirming what we read in 1 Corinthians 8 6. The Father wrought by His Son in the creation of all heavenly beings. So again, source and channel. By Him were all things created. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And so we had read that in Colossians. And now I want to jump down to the last paragraph here. And this is where I think we'll conclude. It says, The law of love being the foundation of the government of God. And so nobody who is a professing Christian would disagree with that, I think. Uh, everybody would say, well, of course, if the Bible says God is love. But as we study the life of his son, who, again, he was dwelt in the bosom of his father, that he manifested his father's name. And we'll look at it in the second half of this first study uh, about why he came. But he showed us what does love really look like. In other words, what is God really like? And there is where we'll see that what the picture that the vast majority of Christianity has had as to what love looks like, it's actually a conditional love. It's not the love that Jesus had actually showed. A love that doesn't condemn or retaliate against any of his enemies because God didn't do that. God didn't do that when Satan, when Lucifer fell and became Satan and the angels. He didn't retaliate. He didn't destroy them. He bore with them long for the sake of all of his created beings, the unfallen beings, the angels being able to make a decision, not under coercion or under fear, under threat that, well, if I cross God, then I'm going to get destroyed too. No, but through time, God and his son were willing to suffer under these lies and this misrepresentation, this character smear that was going on. That is showing us a whole different side of love. And so... That, that is true, exactly what it says here, that love is the foundation of God's government. What does that love look like? The happiness of all intelligent beings depends upon their perfect accord with its great principles of righteousness. God desires from all of his creatures the service of love. So, service of love, what's another name for he desires the service of love? What, what could you say? Obedience, mm -hmm. right? So, the service of love in return for the love that he has given us, that is obedience. How does this obedience come? I think this is really important. A lot of people, I think, we haven't thought about this or we're confused on it. We tend to look at obedience through what you had mentioned earlier, this 
I need to do this old covenant, all that you've said, God, I will do. I will keep your law. I will not sin. I will make oaths and promises. And then within minutes, hours, days, weeks, or months, we find ourselves completely going against what we promised we wouldn't do. All right? There is no righteousness in us. We have a complete and utter incapability of fulfilling God's word in and of ourselves. And that's a good thing. Because God has said, I will do this in you. Exactly. I will give you this clean heart, right? I write my laws onto it. Faithful as he who calls us, who also will do it. So look at this. So here's how obedience happens. Service that springs from what? Love. An appreciation of his character. Mm -hmm. Obedience is a fruit of, in other words, it springs from, it's a response, a natural response. Just as a flower turns to the sunlight, we have in, in our house, Marie and I have and amaryllis. A lot of you know what those are, right? And so it's, it's, it's blooming right now, and it's beautiful. Big red blooms. I mean, some of them are huge, like this, okay? It's like so big, I almost think the thing's going to tip over, but it turns to the light, and then so you rotate it, and then it turns again, just like sunflowers. <laughs> it's just a natural response. So there's an illustration for us that as we appreciate and understand what does his love really look like, who is God really, as we see that in the face of Jesus Christ, that obedience or that service of love happens naturally. We don't manifest it. It's, it's amazing. It's that, it's that simple. We just make it so much harder because we haven't taken the time to learn these things. We haven't taken the time to prayerfully study God's Word and, and seek to answer the difficult scriptures and look at it in the light of the New Testament and the life of Yeshua and bring everything together in the Bible to see these things that, as we'll look at later, we're going to end now, but... As we'll look at, it will confirm that indeed there is no darkness in God at all. And so, hope that was a blessing. I know for a lot of us it's review. But it's always good to review these things and to get these verses fresh in our mind again. And hopefully, it, look, we looked at a few things from some different angles and just see how beautiful the scriptures really are. So let's close with prayer. And before we close, Dennis. Yeah, you say it's a good review, but <clears throat> you know what we're, we're told that what the seal of God is. It's a settling into the truth to the point where we are unmovable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we need these reviews. Amen. Because it helps settle the truth in our mind mm -hmm. to become immovable for that day to glorify our Heavenly Father. Amen. And part of that Im Im immovability comes through again, appreciate appreciating the attributes of his character, yeah, that's right. appreciating his love. And we see that through the relationship that he has with Jesus as his son, who depends upon his father, who trusts his father, who ultimately appreciates that character in his father, which is what gives his father authority. Because if you, in God's position, a God who is completely benevolent, who has given us free will, because that's, if you're going to create, he, he chose to, create intelligent beings. He didn't have to do that, right? But he chose to do that. And so to use that intelligence requires us to be able to think freely and independently without being coerced, without being manipulated, without having the threat of punishment. And so in that process, again, we see that that's what Jesus has been given. He, God brought forth his son who had complete free will. And so he's not going to ever violate that from, for his son or any of the created beings. And so that's where we give authority to, to use that pattern, source and channel. We, in position, because all of us are in positions of submission. That's the only way we will have eternal life is through submission. And there's the channel of blessing. And so all of us have actual heads in this life that are in positions of authority. And we cannot, ultimately, those people in positions of authority don't have full authority if we don't give that to them through an intelligent study of character, ultimately. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. You brought up an interesting point. Uh, there's a law in the universe. We are changed. Uh, as we behold, we become changed. So when we behold a Savior, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is dependent, totally dependent upon his Father. 
and we emulate him, then we become, as Christians, totally dependent upon Christ. Amen. He's totally dependent upon his Father. Amen. But when we behold a Savior who is pretending to be the Son of God, not literally the Son of God, but he just role playing, mm -hmm. make believing, pretending mm -hmm. to be the Son of God. The result is that then we become changed into pretending yeah. to be Christians. Pretending to be Christians, we subconsciously question can we really trust Him? You know, if these are merely just roles. Um, is it, I mean, because if that's not really who you are, but you're just doing that, it seems arbitrary and doesn't make sense. So then that, that affects our faith. And, and then ultimately, if he is delivering himself, trusting in himself to provide for all of his needs and not his father, subconsciously, that's what we'll do too. We'll look to ourselves mm -hmm. to try to fulfill the law of God and his promises. Uh, so... All right, thanks guys. We're going to close with prayer and then we'll take a break. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the settling into the truth and I just pray that we would be uh, like the clay on the potter's wheel, that we would still be pliable to the truth, that you can mold us and shape us as we've been talking about into your image. We've been made, we were made in your likeness, male and female, you have created us to reflect you and your son. Uh, and we see that in the beginning, it was only you and your son. And that he came from you and that he received his character, his divinity, because of who he is from. And we thank you that we can trust and depend upon you because your word tells us you, you are truly a father. And Jesus truly is your son. And that it is through that relationship that we and all of the universe have been patterned. We thank you for giving us intelligence and freedom to think and reflect and appreciate the attributes of your characters we've been doing in this study so that obedience will be the natural fruit, uh, Father, of your love uh, flowing into our lives. Let us extend that freedom, that liberty to others. Let us not coerce and force. Let us bear as you and your son bear with us, with long-suffering, hoping all things, bearing all things, believing all things, and enduring all things. Thank you, Father, for this revelation of your love in the cross. We ask and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, for those <coughs> online that are, or who are watching the recording, you can check out our short videos as well that go over this. And uh, we'll see you next time.